Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur Show. I'm Justin Bazaar. I'm your host. That's B I W Z A W R O. For anyone who's out there, you can reach us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs or on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. That is um, what this podcast is about. Just I know I get a lot of questions. Uh, what kind of podcast? What's my aim? What's my vision? Uh, what am I trying to accomplish? It's a message, guys. We're using entrepreneur story to, sh- one, share their story, uh, promote their business, but also promote entrepreneurism, help other entrepreneurs in the food space out there, hear from real live entrepreneurs living it right in this moment. And I'm going to clarify this uh, before we introduce our guests, just so I can tee this up a little bit on, on some of the things we're going to talk about in this episode. But it is education, typically when we pay for it, whether we do our bachelor's or our master's or whatever, it's in hindsight, okay? So that being said is most of the information we learn in business school or in entrepreneur classes or whatever it is are not the hard knocks that actually build a business. They are hindsight. They build a foundation, but those things are now long gone where if you try to use them in their exact form, they're no longer matter in the business world. And that's the problem with education facing backwards. And no matter what, it's always going to be that way because something's going to happen. Someone's going to write about it. It's going to be in the past. And with this podcast, what we're trying to do is capture things in the moment as much as possible. Learn from the entrepreneurs. And as we sort of grow this entrepreneur uh, podcast and this food podcast, we have been able with partnerships and, and with help and with the team start to diversify the way we're doing the podcast. I mean, we're starting to get into more topics and we're going to start getting into leadership and tying in some other podcasts we're working on on leadership as well as just the entrepreneur in general um, and being a human in this world uh, through humans that are successful and outside of the food world, I should say. So There's a lot of things going on, but mainly what I'm trying to say is we're trying to give the information from the entrepreneurs that are living it right now. That's why I continue to tell their stories. That's why we continue to do parts as long as the entrepreneurs are willing to and want to uh, and continue to tell their story because that's what this is. It's not a flash in a pan. It's not as an entrepreneur, we have one idea in one day and the rest of life is golden for us. That's never the way it works. And if you look at any food entrepreneur, Every two to three years, we're pivoting and rebranding in some way. And I don't mean rebranding the business, but we're having to come up with new concepts, new ideas that give us a little bit of a twist. Keep the core business, keep the things that you do well, but you're constantly having to invent things around the business that may become part of the business. But customers change, preferences change, competition changes, market changes, the government changes, the regulations change, all the things they talk about and grad school or business school or undergraduate all true the thing is is if we're looking at them in hindsight we've already missed the opportunity to adjust to them so this podcast is to trying to get the group of entrepreneurs that are on the podcast that are also now moving into a group which is free you come on the podcast right now there is a free group that is being set up for all the entrepreneurs who are on the podcast to be a part of that group. No, it's not going to be offered to the whole world. It's free. I'm giving it away for free. That means there was an exchange there. There was the podcast. We're growing the world. Now I want them to help grow each other so they can go rule the world in freedom, liberty, and entrepreneurship, which to anchor it for everyone, entrepreneurs' dreams are always big enough to have the dreams of all the individuals around them in it. I want to say that again. Entrepreneurs' dreams are always big enough to have all the individuals around them's dreams within it. Meaning, I've got to put, if I'm an entrepreneur and I have a business, I've got to know that the person that works for me, they have a life. They have a family to support, possibly. They may have kids that need to go through college. I need to be long term minded what the benefit of the business is because I don't want to negatively infect. Uh, impact that employee through doing something that may impact them negativity negatively in the long run. So again, why do we do this? We are living in the moment. We will start diving more into subject matter and topics that are more closely to the entrepreneurs. I've heard the feedback. I, I understand the questions and we, we have started different questions for a part two, a part three, and we've asked entrepreneurs who are coming back on the show to get more specific in a particular field that they enjoy, whether it's accounting or the taxes or whatever it is. Those are probably two that no one enjoys, but that's why I used them. (laughs) And, um, And so that's 
that's where we are, and that's where the podcast is. This is episode number 304. Um, if you would have told me six months ago I'd have 300 episodes by now, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, if you told me four and a half years ago when I'd started this podcast that I'd still be doing it four and a half years later, uh, even with the ups and downs that it's had, the different transitions, different partners, different co-hosts, different sponsors, um, it's been quite interesting, and I've been in different businesses and a different business person, and I definitely am a much different person than I was, or different human than I was four and a half years ago. So this podcast has been a growth for me as well, and I hope that everyone in the audience is getting the same benefit, and I believe that is true since everyone is sharing it. The word of mouth continues to go up. The downloads continue to go up. The views continue to go up, and the listens continue to go up because there's all three, depending on which platform you use to listen. Uh, all are different. All platforms use a little bit of difference to rate how the podcast is doing. So there's always that to keep in mind. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce Tatissimo from Nashville, Tennessee, my temporary home right now. Anna, how are you doing today? I'm good. I, I love everything you just said. I, I was nervous until I got really invested in that, everything you were saying <laughs> uh it's a it's true right i mean whether we see it or not life just um it happens for us really um in the moments and it's hard to yeah, capture and, that in the past i'm always telling people to to talk to other other business uh owners other entrepreneurs it's, it's definitely like what's gotten me this far i would say yeah absolutely so anna yeah. let's talk about your story uh, and let's talk about like how you created a business why nashville how'd you end up there let's really go into the depths here like from when you were a little bambina <laughs> to when you were an adult um what's your family background where'd you grow up how'd you get into food why'd you become an entrepreneur um my family is from guadalajara mexico which is like a central part of mexico and then I was born and raised on the central coast of California in Santa Maria. Um, when I moved to Nashville, it was completely random. I had, I was in the music industry at the time, and I was online and found some clickbait that led me to a music conference that was at Belmont, and I went to that, and then just was like, Nashville is so pretty, and the squirrels are so friendly, and I'm going to move there. And nobody believed me and then and then I moved here and I um thought I would probably be here for a couple of years to finish school and then find a bigger metro or something, but Nashville just became that bigger metro instead and now there's all the opportunities that I didn't know I was gonna find here. Yeah, I wanna talk about this a little bit. One, the squirrels are friendly in Nashville. Like it's, it's the weirdest so thing. Weird. It's really weird. It's really, really weird. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, yeah, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't and, and, I know, especially like on a campus like Belmont's so green and so pretty. Like I don't see that. I mean, I guess I do see squirrels in my backyard, but I don't interact with them like I did on my first visit to Nashville. But it was like July. It was beautiful. And I just I knew it sounded like really dumb, but I was like, I'm telling you, the squirrels are friendly there. So like what could go wrong? I'm going to move there. I love this. And I'm over near Belmont and Vanderbilt near Music Row um, right now. And the squirrels are literally, even they come up to my dog and my dog wants to eat them. But they're like, they want to be friends. Like, and I'll be walking down the street and they come up to me, especially now with spring. And it's the strangest thing. I like, I'm like, like, is this God trying to tell me something here? But I agree with you. When I came, when I first got there in last fall i noticed it and now it's like the spring has come and even the rabbits are weirdly friendly like the rabbits come up are, are weirdly not afraid either um yeah and it's the craziest thing and i'm not sure where that comes from but i've never seen anything like it and they're weirdly friendly they come up to you i was at a friend's house a couple months ago and she has tons of rabbits in her yard 
and they all like even with the dog the dog's friendly with them they all play and i'm like what is going on here and the squirrel's not afraid of the dog in her yard either and they the squirrel's like running up and down a tree and a rope and i'm like what is going on here but either way nashville obviously dr doolittle might live there i guess so um, yeah, there's like a different type of nature here that I've gotten to interact with. Maybe it maybe just cuz I'm like a better person now and I can slow down more or whatever. I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty of nature I missed in California, but here I feel like my eyes were really open to it with not just animals, but even especially now being in the um like food food system and farms and all that. I've I've experienced things I did not know that were going to be such a big part of my life. So, Anna, I actually um, have been to Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, really? And, yeah, when I did my master's degree program at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels. Um, it was part of a one MBA program with four other universities from around the world. And Agade in Guadalajara was one of those universities. Um, I believe it's there, near there, maybe. But I actually um, p- was there because of that program. I was in Mexico City made it up north in Guadalajara and Agades even maybe a little farther north than that in Monterey actually um, I think but during that time I got to spend time in Guadalajara so I may be gee it's weird actually normally I'm really good at geography I think my mind's all backwards now on yeah so Guadalajara and the candy there and the food um like I ate crickets, I think, and and stuff like that, and just so cool the stuff that I ate in Mexico and the exposure that I had, um, mezcal and tequila. Um, back then, I don't drink anymore, but back then I did, um, and I enjoyed all of those things. Um, and just for the audience reference, I drink. I don't drink mainly because I'm trying to become a superpower in my life, and I don't want any distractions or disruptions or setbacks or mental things that slow me down. I just become Mm -hmm. hyper determined over the last five years. So that's just who I am. But I mean, you, we were talking a little bit before and, and we had a glitch here just so the audience knows it was my fault. And, um, but we were talking about you spending time in Guadalajara and not being able to spend much time in Mexico, um, during the glitch. So I wanted to go back and touch on that a little bit. Yeah. It's really like a constant, bummer in my life that I haven't spent enough time in Mexico. I went in December finally after having that goal for so long, but um it's just so vast like all the all the culture there is to take in in even one city, let alone Mexico in general. So I stuck to Mexico City this time, but I would really love to spend some time in Guadalajara where my family's from. And um I went when I was 8 which was just to pick up my mom's mom, my grandma. And then I haven't really gotten to go much. A lot of my cousins have gone like annually on trips, but um, interestingly, just because my my parents uh, took longer to become documented, then I didn't really get the luxury of going back and forth. Um, and now, I mean, I obviously, every day I wish I could pop in and, just get some of that experience to, to plug into my business. But, but it also, I also feed a lot from the community around me because so many people are from different parts of the world, not just Mexico, but like Peru and Colombia and Cuba. And it's just really fun, like opening your eyes to the world in different countries. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit because I think it's part of why you've become an entrepreneur. I think it's part of why you're chasing the American dream. Um, what was it like growing up being part of the, well, being a first generation, I guess, American in a way, or maybe not necessarily first generation growing up here, kind of, but your parents being the first generation. I don't know if you, you weren't born here, so technically maybe the first generation is your children. Um, I don't know how that works, actually, now that I think about it, but um, and what the proper terms are. But talk to me about this. What was it like growing up in California? What was it like? You had setbacks. Your parents were obviously trying to gain citizenship, and that was important to them and for you. So what was that like? What did it inspire in you? Um, I am technically first generation because I was born in California, um, and my siblings also were, but I do have a lot of cousins that were not. So 
I mean, I think it's only like now that I'm an adult that I'm even able to grasp what it was like growing up that way. Um, because it just was like everyone around me was going through the same thing. Like some of, uh, some of my cousins had certain challenges because they weren't born here that I didn't have. But then on my end, there was a lot of, um, just, I guess being like regular being Mexican American struggles that I like barely now can, can figure out in my brain, like having to, um, select, you know, white on your standardized testing or whatever, like all these different things I'm still unpacking. But I mean, I, I enjoyed it. California is definitely a great place to grow up. If you're, uh, Hispanic, there's, there's a lot of other people going through what you're going through. It's kind of like New York City, I think, in a way, um, in some ways, in, in Miami, I think that there's the mixing pot and the diversity of immigration, and a lot of people are in your same situation, and there's a hustle. Um, this is what it's I... actually... Go ahead. Now, now that I live here is kind of, and I guess also, like, now that I'm an adult, is when I've started to put the pieces together of, like, what what I lack and what I didn't get in my childhood along the way that would have really served me now like just being around people that didn't grow up that way and um people that maybe have like a better education or way better resources because their parents are um educated or come from any amount of money whatsoever so that's like a a thing that i don't think is necessarily like a setback because it also fuels me in a lot of ways but but it is like, you know, every day in the owning a business, like it would be nice if I had more resources, just always, especially being an ambitious person, you also, you always want to have more resources. And, and then you're around other ambitious people that do have their, those resources. And it makes it just more obvious, like what you want to, I guess, uh, build for yourself for the future. I like this a lot, this topic, actually, because I think that um, we as humans especially as entrepreneurs, um, we can sometimes get in this com this comparison cycle and it's not good, number one, um, because we're all individual and we all have our own paths. But I do agree with you on the exposure part of our children and of our lives. I think that sometimes our parents' fears or um, things that they're stuck to become that of the child's or the children also. And it's unintentional, mm -hmm. but it becomes the same... It, it becomes a setback to the next generation because the next generation is the American dream in the United States. And we do have the opportunity to transcend economic boundaries, political boundaries, whatever it is that we want to state boundaries pretty easily. We can move anywhere and we can move ourselves intellectually and economically if we choose to. And we put the time mm -hmm. and the effort in. But it does. It is harder. I agree. If you don't have the exposure um, and the connections. And one well, of the things I... Go ahead. Uh, no, you can finish your thought. No, no. I think that it just is become harder. I have a point that I'm, I'm going to make, and it's more or less of... I just was actually talking to someone about this today, and the person was like, why are you connecting with these, me with these individuals? Like, why are you networking me with them? Like, I, I don't know if the brand matches my personal brand or my brand. And I'm like, mm -hmm. listen, I understand what you're saying 100%. But what's wrong is your, your thinking. And the thinking is wrong just in that essence in its entirety. And it's going to hurt you in the long run. Here's why. Every person you meet, regardless of whether you can do business with them now, is a person you should build a relationship with because you never know when that person's going to end up or where they're going to end up or how. And that connection and that exposure and that going around the world and meeting a diverse group of people matters. And and mm -hmm. often people get so locked in, oh, what can this person do for me now? And, and why are you introducing me to this person? They don't benefit my business now. No, I'm not introducing you because... 
you know, there's a transaction here. You're two like-minded people. You have something in common. I bet you can help each other in the long run. I don't care whether you can help each other now. I'm not, that's not my focus. I don't get attached to the outcome right now. I've had to learn that. It's not about the outcome right now. The legacy will long outlast us as humans. Whatever we do now, whether we realize it or not, has a really strong echoing effect for life. Okay, we can talk about the people that started AA. Think about that impact. We can talk about Jesus. Think about his impact. Think about Constantine in 313 AD when he made Christianity the the Roman religion. So these mm-hmm. little decisions by these little individuals, whether we know it or not, we can see the impact years later. I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous in the 1930s went from one, a couple of people in Iowa or somewhere, nowhere, Chicago. I don't even know where it started. Or maybe it was New York. I have no idea. But now it's all over the world. And now thousands upon thousands and millions of people are helped and saved every day, you know, if they choose. That's and so, so wild. So, Like, think about the impact that we have even after we die as entrepreneurs, because a lot of entrepreneurs that go out and do great things and do great businesses, they met great people. And I will use AA as an example just because I'm familiar with it because of my family history and other family histories. But it is this, like, two people met each other. Alone, there was no AA. Two people, two different backgrounds, two selfish men, Maybe they're married with kids, problems, whatever. But the thing is, they had nothing in common other than alcohol and a wanting to stop drinking and wanting to help other individuals. Otherwise, a doctor and a salesman, I think one was a salesman and one was a doctor, they had nothing in common. They weren't in the same industry. They didn't sell things. He didn't sell medical devices. There was nothing in common. He wasn't in psychiatry. Nothing in common with these individuals other than they eventually discovered they both were suffering from alcoholism. And they there was no solution for them. And they needed to come up with a program. And what I want to focus on on this and why I brought it up and why I'm going to attach it to Anna's story is this, is because they did what they did and they did it with a mission to help other individuals and not just themselves, it became what we know it today. And there's no dues or fees. Let me just put it to you this way. AA is totally self-sufficient by the individuals in it. They don't go get outside dollars. They don't go get sponsorships. They don't go to some nonprofit or whoever to help them. It is the individuals in there doing the meetings, volunteering their time, putting in their own money. And it's one of those things. The reason the program works is because they all believe in it and it's all passed down. But the second reason it works is because it's actually a life program. And anyone that takes all the steps out of an AA program can put those steps into your everyday life. All AA did when these two individuals did is they figured out how to make life manageable through a 12-step program. And alcoholics or, or drug addicts or addiction people identify their problem and then go through the 12 steps and become superhumans a lot of the time, whether we know it or not. Yeah. Um, but it's because they went through those 12 steps of life that anyone can go through. And it goes back to my point, which we need exposure we need experience in the world and we need to make sure that we're not looking at something as, oh, I have nothing in common with them. What do I want from them? Because we don't know why they've been brought into our life. We don't know what those connections will bring. And when we get tied up in um, some of the what they have and I don't have, I think we lose fact of God's given us something to overcome that's going to come our superpower if we choose to face it head on. And I think that that's where you are, Anna. I think you are uh, hardship, pain, the the disadvantages all ha- all will become your superpowers and your advantages. It's just it takes time, um, and so I don't know why I went on that tangent, but no, I think so too. I mean, you were talking about um, just having connections, I guess, to other people, and and I was thinking about that in relation to like uh even role models or having like other people around you that can inspire you in one way or another i think just if whether they're in your industry or not like everything you were saying it's something i've only recently kind of gotten comfortable with because um that whole mentality of like you know wanting to meet everyone and know their story that's very much like my my mom was always that way and it always kind of like stressed me out because i felt like 
just really anxious meeting people and um and we would also take people in a lot just um that was a big part of my childhood my mom was i think having been taken in as like someone who was new to the country like it was really important to her to help other people that way but for me like growing up in that environment was like super unstable and so it took a really long time to like unlearn that resistance i had to just strangers in general but now um i'm finding like like her exact personality is like i want to be like that now because i'm like everybody i meet and that's like the the whole restaurant industry it's like that exact concept you're meeting people you would never normally like spend time with but they become like your best friends or people you learn like amazing lessons from or people that just like you can tell a story that you learned from them that just sticks with you for the rest of your life and it's like people you would normally never interact with because you're in a restaurant and that's something i think the restaurant industry gave me back that ability to just like want to connect with like the human race i guess I agree with you 100%. I think that there's a connection there and almost a humanness to all of it. Um, and it sort of, I can get disgruntled at the, the human race as well in general, or, you know, for me, it's a lack of effort. It's the lack, and it's really my most frustrating thing is the people's ability to waste the life that they've been given and the time that they've been given or the impact that they can make. That's just really hard for me because I've never, I've always understood the gift I was given growing up on a farm and how valuable life is and how awesome. it can pass and go so quickly and without anything that the individual or the animal did wrong it just is life and life happens oh and um and when you think about things that way you realize that you're n you're on borrowed time always always mm -hmm. borrowed it's never yours it's yours to do to make the most out of with your family, with being present with the individuals in your life. And I say this a lot. If things don't line up in your business or in your relationships or whatever, you have to adjust it quickly because negativity can, can blossom badly and blossom is usually a good thing, but negativity can blossom <laughs> as well. And it's not a good thing. So, um, although it yeah, that's something on I have to used. fight for sure. I think, uh, I'm not naturally a negative person at all, but um, being in like a constant state of overwhelm in your first few years of business, it's really hard to, uh, I guess just keep a handle on that. So I found like, I'm not Catholic, but last year for, um, for Lent, I just decided I wanted to give up complaining. And, um, and then suddenly was like, Oh my gosh, I p apparently complain all the time now because I'm so stressed all the time. And, um, yeah, you definitely have to keep a handle on that stuff. Let's go back to, um, you know, the questions that sort of I we've laid out because I really, you know, we've we've had really good conversation, but I want to make sure we tell your story. Like, okay. so let's talk about your brand. Let's talk about your business. Let's talk about how'd you come with the idea, the name, what is the menu, the recipe, and, and how'd you come up with all this? And were you in food before this? I think we talked about it a little, but... I want to dive a little more into that. I mean, was this sort of like something you just went into? Like, how did you take these steps to get to where you are? Um, I wasn't exactly in food. I was in the hospitality industry. Um, so after I graduated from Belmont and kind of joined the workforce, I was focusing on my acting career. So I, um, have that going also, but I wanted a job in the, in the hospitality industry so I could have the flexibility that I needed. And so I started um, helping to run the bar at a Puerto Rican restaurant. And that was kind of my first taste at the food and beverage world. It was really cool to do some creative things. Like at that time we had a really nice selection of rum and I had the idea to put on some rum flights and, um, and it was really nice working with an owner who was receptive to my ideas and like watching, watching something go from an idea to like implementing it, to sharing that experience with someone who would not have had that experience if it weren't for your ideas, like a really amazing feeling that, um, that I get to have now in my business. But from there, I went to a Husk restaurant, which is a fine dining restaurant here in Nashville. And that was like, I mean, it was really like Disneyland for me at that time. 
it was my first exposure to a lot of different things, not just the way that they do hospitality there, but different ingredients that I didn't know existed. Um, just different attention to detail that I didn't really know other people would care about. And, um, and from there, when the pandemic hit, um, I, it was def definitely like a big pivot because going back to being a server during like opening during the pandemic was really like not something that I wanted to do because the, the pop-up was kind of already in my life. And I just decided to like go full force with that. Um, Husk is also where I met my business and life partner, um, Josh Cook, and he was doing some pop-ups and I kind of just got on board with that. And before Tantissimo ever existed, he and I did a pop-up together and I did the pastries for it. And I knew I had enough foresight, I guess, to know that I would probably keep doing pastries here and there for people just to like get me through the pandemic. And so I called the business uh, Tantito Pastelito, which means a little bit of cake. And then eventually it became a bigger thing with uh, savory food. And so I wanted to have a brand that could encompass more things, not just um, savory food, but also um, eventually maybe a gift shop or greeting cards or all these different things that are just like kind of thoughtful arts other than food. And so that's where Tantissimo came in. It was the beginning, like the prefix from Tantito Pastelito and the suffix is Isimo, which is, um, you know, just like an emphasis. Uh, but it comes from letters that my dad and I would write each other where he would say like, um, Te extraño muchísimo, which means like, I miss you so much. Like as soon as you add that little suffix, it, it just means more. <laughs> so that's where that name came from. So tell me about the menu. How did you come up with it? What are the items on the menu? And where can they find you online or in person? How do they, do they get to you guys? The menu has gone through some evolution. It, it um, We started at farmer's markets and we started with the grill. So we were doing um, farm to table tacos, street food like quesadillas and things like that. And then Eventually, we had to switch to prepackaged foods, and we did um, a lot of tamales and burritos, and those we still have, um, like frozen six packs you can get at uh, the Richland Park Farmers Market on Saturday mornings. Um, but now, our main gig for Tantissimo, we're at a bar called um, Henry James. It's a cocktail bar, and our kitchen is there seven days a week, um, starting at 5 p.m. We go all evening. And we do um, elevated Latin American small plates. So I actually work with um, two of the chefs that I met at Husk, Josh Cook, who's my business partner, and then um, another chef whose name is Brett and also his wife, um, Ashley. We're all kind of leading um, what we're doing there right now. So a lot of those uh, ideals that we learned are with us, a lot of farm to table, a lot of um, bold flavors and just really a lot of attention to detail to things like texture and we've got a grill in there. We're just kind of pulling out all the stops for these small plates that we don't really see around town. There's other, there's other cocktail bars doing things like crudos and tartars and those are so delicious. I love them and I want them every day, but there's not really another place that I can think of that's doing Latin American small plates um, on that, on that level. So I'm really excited about what we're doing there right now. How many, how many, um, how many people do you have working your business? How have you scaled it? How have you figured out how to bring the stuff to market? I mean, how'd you figure out where to go? How'd you figure out to start at the farmer's market? I know you talked about pop-ups before, but how do you build the relationships with your customers? I mean, there's so many questions I have. I guess I asked a lot there and I'm a little hyped up this morning. Yeah. Sorry. No, um, it's okay. Um, I, yeah, I kind of answer those questions like every day. Cause it, like you said, it changes every day. Um, but it started with, well, I mean, when I was at the farmer's markets, just doing dessert, it was definitely like just me. And sometimes I would get help from like a relative. Um, I've got a lot of cousins that live in town and they're very supportive, but then eventually, um, once we started doing tacos that got really popular and it got out of, uh, I had to hire a friend. So one of our close friends who um, had some experience in the industry, RJ, he came in and helped 
um, build the business for that whole year, but pretty much. And then um, it's just a lot of connections. Like you said, everything has, has evolved very naturally. I've kind of felt different things out. There was a time that I thought I would do, I would focus on just those frozen tamales and try to put them as many places as I could. And then a different thing would catch my attention. It, it does take like a lot of time to figure out like what you really enjoy spending your time on. Cause this business could have gone a lot of different ways. And, and I think there's a lot of different ways that I could have made money. Um, but I'm trying to figure out like how, what way I want to spend my time and what way I want to lead the business like long term. that might actually take longer to make money. But it's like, th this is what got me in interested in the first place is like this whole idea of like farm to table and sustainable food and giving people something they can't get somewhere else. So it's been a lot of just kind of keeping keeping those values in mind and then finding people along the way that um, feel the same way about things. We're definitely really lucky with the team we have right now. Um, I also had had have had help with my from my family for sure. And then um, and then there have been times we've just put up signs like at our booths that we're hiring and we've had people come join our team from that just because they like what what we're doing, what they see right before them and they want to be a part of it. I love this. I love that you're very relationship oriented and you build relationships with people. I can tell by reading between the lines and everything that you're talking about. Like, I don't know if it's culturally, I don't know if it's something you really focus on, but talk to me a little bit about this. Like you obviously really invest in people and get to know people and you talk about how you met your partner and things like that. Is Am I, am I sensing this correctly and, and why is it so important to you? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I definitely wish that things were running perfectly smoothly every day so I could spend even more time um, just building people up and and especially like using using food as a tool for relationship building is like, I guess, the, the on our best days, that's exactly what we're doing. And that's how I want to spend my time interacting with a customer and finding out what they liked and what was special to them and So a lot of times you you share what you made and then they share a story of what it reminds them of and they have a connection to a really special memory that they have, um, things like that. So that's kind of our, our goal all the time is just like now I do a lot of admin and I'm trying to constantly make things, I, I basically build it in a way so that I can have the experience I had at the beginning of like when you're at a farmer's market, it's all relationships. You get to meet all of your customers. You get to hear all of the feedback. You get to see your peers next to you. Um, so it's like entirely relationships almost. And then as it grows, it's harder, but I'm working back towards that all the time. And that's definitely like a huge motivator of why I, why I decided I wanted to do this full time because Like I said, I'm, I'm also an actor and I didn't think I needed another career. I was just going to keep, you know, doing a good job serving at a restaurant that I loved and, and then eventually land better gigs, I figured. But now that um, I started, I guess, building these relationships within the food community and, and the Latin American community here in Nashville, it made it so that I just loved it. And now I care about this career just as much, if, if not more, and, as what I do in the acting community in my film world. Um, but at the beginning, I was really surprised, honestly, that I was able to connect with the community because I had, when I was 16, I had tried to make a business out of wedding cakes. And I was really like, I'm going to get the best flour. I'm going to get the best eggs and I'm going to do things in like French styles. And I was learning all these things that no other 16 year olds cared about around me. And so I just like, in my head forever, I was like, oh, like no one cares about like high quality pastries. So I didn't think I'd ever come back to food because, you know, you go to a potluck and you see cool up like on every table. And I didn't realize that there was like this whole world of people that thinks how I think when it comes to food. So when I started putting out these really thoughtful pastries and, and people responded really well, it was really exciting. What's your favorite thing on your menu and what's the most popular? Um, our menu at Henry James, I think right now, it does change a lot seasonally. And then also because we've got some new equipment, so it's going to keep changing. But we've got a really delicious spicy pork tamale. that has got like a cilantro relish 
um, Josh, he made that dish this week. It's really, really good. My favorite thing that I've still got on is my uh, bread and butter, as simple as it is. It's a Mexican bolillo roll, which is kind of like, I guess, a Mexican baguette, but it's short and fat, and the inside is like completely just a fluffy cloud, and the outside is like a hard crust. And then we do that with the bourbon honey butter. So I'm really proud of that one. And then when we do um, have like a grill and we do tacos, then the, the most popular one is uh, for sure the birria taco and then also the al pastor tacos. Those are things we get asked for a lot at the farmer's market. Um, but right now we're limited to prepackaged items until we get some legislation passed to change that. Okay. Nashville. Let's talk about this a little bit. Why did you end up staying there? Why um, not move a food business somewhere else? I know the answer personally, honestly, but at least if it were me. But for you, what? why stay? Why stay? And at that time, I mean, comparative to California, Nashville's not exactly the pay- place to start a food business per se if you're an outsider or your perception is that. Why do you think that it's a good place? What do you see going on there? Or w- why did you stay there to do this? Um, I mean, I think it it's the idea of moving a business now. It just doesn't. I guess it's really it comes back to relationships. Like you said, I, I just worked with what I had that was around me. If I if I wouldn't have built those relationships I built while working in the service industry, I don't think I would ever have had the idea to start a restaurant or a pop-up or anything even remotely close. Um, I was actually like adamantly opposed to it. Like I said, after that little baking failure I had when I was 16, I had a subsequent decade of people telling me like, Oh, this is so delicious. You should open a bakery. And I would get frustrated and just say like, I know like I'm definitely not doing that ever. I hated it. And that was true until until it wasn't until I saw a different way to do things. And I think COVID also played a part in, in making it so that there was time to appreciate the way we were doing things just like culturally here. I think it's, um, I think it's one of those things where, um, you found a place and Nashville is a growing food place and the food truck game and the food market and the restaurant game and the the restaurant carts, the hot dog carts and other carts Mm -hmm. that are popping up everywhere on Broadway is quite incredible. So I yeah. think that any human that's trying to do well, or there's a lot of ex musicians who come into the food space and, and stuff like that. But so Nashville true. happens to be really a catalyst right now for entrepreneurship and food. Um, and the way the showmanship is done and the professionalism because of the city and because of the nature of the city and the music business all music not just country music i want to emphasize that for everyone because everyone's like why do you talk about that i'm like it's actually music city not country music city it's just a weird thing that everyone asks me about all the time and makes assumptions and i'm just like hmm but the um i want to make sure that we understand that when i'm talking about relationships and diversity and in a city it's not country music it's why the food and the diversity of food is becoming so big because everyone goes there for different types of music now and even in the country music honky tonks that are owned by country music stars, they play DJs and they have rock and roll music a majority of the time. Um, it's not only Very country true. music. So um, I also want to go back to the relationship thing just because I interestingly, as we've been talking about this, I got a text in and it's like under the same topic. It's like I, I just – every – opportunity we have to make a difference on someone or make an impression or get to know someone or have a possible someone in our Rolodex down the road that we may know or be able to reach out to not only for help for ourselves but maybe we have a friend in need maybe we have daughters sons children in need and as parents like to go back to where we talked about before with our parents like as parents like I feel that we should encourage these relationships and exposure to these individuals in the world bringing them into work, bringing them to business meetings, taking them on trips. And, you know, I guess not every kid's probably set out to do that um, or has the discipline to do that. I don't know. But 
for me, it was part of my experience. I grew up on a farm. It was an entrepreneurial business. I lived the business. I formed businesses of my own at a very young age. And I watched my father in the business world, in the food world, uh, you know, travel the world for food on airplanes. So it's one of those things where I think it's hugely important. We get the exposure and the experience. But I will say this. One of the things that I always, why I emphasize relationships so much is because it's something I was never good at. Like I've always been very individual. I played soccer and and I was a team based person in that that zone, but I was still very much in it to win because I liked winning. And I, I was very yeah. much not quote unquote a teammate if someone wasn't holding their end. I was gonna push them or ask the coach to replace them because I wanted to win. You know, so like I had to learn to build relationships. I had to learn to be softer. I have to learn to not be so direct and and not so wanting every individual to grow because not every individual wants to grow and not every Mm -hmm. individual wants to be pushed to be a better person. And not every person cares about the wisdom that I have to bestow on them or any person has to bestow upon them or, or the help you might be able to help them with. And sometimes the same is true for me. I don't always want help. It's better when I go look for it. And I talked about this on the last podcast, which is definitely education or life. Uh, things that we grow from are caught, not taught. We catch them because we're willing to catch them. We aren't taught them. Taught. If someone tries to teach me something I'm not willing to learn or, or pay attention, it's never going to be taught to me. I don't care how much that person cares about teaching it. If I'm That's not willing true. to catch I, it. I do think like if uh, a lot of times though that – I guess wisdom that you might reject, like it still stays in your brain. So when you do learn something for yourself, then it comes, it comes out and you remember what someone said and it kind of helps to cement the lesson. So I do think it's, it's useful. I like advice a lot, um, which I know is not necessarily common, but even still, like if I, if something doesn't ring true for me now, it might ring true for me later. Like once I start to understand things better, but I think we have a lot in common. I also uh, would not have considered myself a social person before this business. And I think it's it's helping. But also, like, I mean, bringing food or bringing baked goods is a great icebreaker. That's probably was always my little party trick was to bring a baked good to something and then just let that speak for me. So it's a really good bridge for me. What's your favorite things about being an entrepreneur or or the business that you run being in the food game? Um, I think, well, one, I, my biggest fear is probably just being bored in life in general. So I don't ever have that. I'm never bored. And I like being able to use different skills that I've picked up throughout my life. Um, I think our first pop-up we ever did, I noticed it right away. Like I was doing all these different things that needed doing. And I was one minute I was uh, making a poster. So I'm like, Oh, like I did graphic design when I was interning at black river entertainment. And then the next minute I was taking pictures of food and thinking about different things I've learned while doing auditions about, you know, cameras and whatnot. And the next minute I'm doing admin work and that comes from the times I've worked in offices. So just like kind of being able to give a purpose to all the different skills I've picked up throughout life has been really awesome. Um, it can also be really overwhelming until you start delegating, but I love, love that part. And I think uh, also, I guess the the concept of legacy, I'm, I'm not really there yet at all, but it is nice to be working towards something that can, can grow like I've already grown way past what I thought I was going to be doing, which, like I said, I, I thought I would be doing pastries for a little bit um, just to get me through the pandemic. And now I, I essentially have a restaurant inside of Henry James Bar. Um, and it's, we've got some big goals for the next year or two. So it's already grown a lot more than I originally intended. And I like the idea that I can continue to grow something like this business is definitely my baby. I would say that. What are you hoping the future brings? Like, where do you see this going in, you know, the 5, 10, 20 year range, maybe even up to 100 years? Because I do write that in my questions that I give you guys before the thing. But where do you see yeah. this? Where do you want this to go? I mean, like, we can talk really big, as big as you want to talk, um, really, because I think putting it out there in the universe really matters. Yeah. I know. I saw that question. I thought it was really cool because it's not something I would ask myself um, since I'm still in the 
like get through the day, get through the week uh, mentality. But that's also why I like surrounding myself with other other business people that are thinking in a way that I'm not thinking so I don't get stuck. Um, but I think now, well, like I said, uh, Josh Cook is my business partner now and he actually just started about two weeks ago. And then um, we've, we've just kind of solidified our team. So it kind of frees my brain up to be able to even think bigger now that I have so much more help than I did for the first two years. But I think within maybe two years or so, we could have uh, some sort of a brick and mortar. He and I have slightly different concepts, but there's a lot of places here in Nashville that kind of have side-by-side -side concepts, like Bastion's one, one example. They've got a tasting menu, and then they've got a bar beside it. Um, and so we've got some ideas of how to how to kind of tie in our two visions. I've got um, I've been wanting to do a Latin American gift shop for a really long time. And so I think that would be a big part of our brick and mortar. Um, and then another big goal for once we're established in some sort of uh, space, I would really love to do events um, for the Latin American community. That was something that um, Salsa, the Puerto Rican restaurant did and uh, Plaza Mariachi also does, but um, I think we would just do it in a different way and there's not, necessarily um enough of that um and i think like as we're if we were to become you know more stable more successful we we'll definitely want to just find ways to keep contributing to the community that all this food comes from and maybe do some cooking classes or do um uh things like helping to train people that might be interested in the food industry but don't have resources um, and then going back to the, uh, I think I might've mentioned greeting cards really briefly. There's, there's kind of like a whole separate side of Bentissimo that I want. That's, that's not food related, not just the, uh, not just the gift shop, but also the whole culture, um, which will be like things like merch and, um, and greeting cards is a big one for me. I love that. So um, as we start to sort of wrap things up here, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, like who's inspired you growing up, who motivated you, where where you look to, has it been recently? Like, or, or are you looking to people now? Like you talked a little bit about your fellow entrepreneurs. Like talk to me a little bit about like what keeps you going every day also and, and who and what has inspired you in your life. Um, well, I gain, a, I get a lot of my motivation and inspiration from, I would say like peers. Um, that's one of the reasons I, I love being in the farmer's market is you get to see what other people are doing. And, you know, sometimes you have that feeling of like, I, I wish I would have had that idea. And I think that's a really good and really motivating feeling because if you keep going, like next time it'll be you having the really great idea. Um, and I think like just the vision that I just described as a big motivator as well. Were you asking, uh, I missed your question a little bit, but were you asking about specific um, yeah. business people? Businesses or any humans that's inspired you, like in general, it doesn't have to necessarily just be business oriented. Um, there's one business person, um, Marie Forleo is like a business coach that I follow and um, I like her a lot. Her her concept is uh, she's got a catchphrase. It's everything is figure outable that she got from her mom, and I really like that because it kind of ties into a, a lot of my way of thinking comes from my mom, and it's just the idea of like there's always a way to figure it out, and if you're not figuring it out, it's because you quit, and you're not supposed to quit. You're supposed to keep going until there's an answer that works. Um, so I, I would say my mom is a, is a big one. I've seen her move mountains on many occasions. Um, and I, that's why I know, like, I have to use discernment. Like, not every battle is worth fighting. But if there is something that I do think is worth fighting for, like, I'm pretty much always positive that I'll be able to figure it out eventually, which is really a good feeling to have, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um I really enjoyed this podcast, honestly, and I enjoyed getting to know you and learning about your business and just so many 
ways. I mean, it's just incredible. If you could share anything with entrepreneurs out there or share anything with the world or give your own inspiration or help anyone, how, what would it be, you know, what are the things that you'd want to share? Um, I think I would definitely, uh, what I would change, I guess, if I, if I was starting today is more just like get, get help sooner. Um, there were a lot of things that I made more difficult on myself than I had to. I would definitely encourage you to ask for help. And I think it's really easy if you're really passionate about something to get really sucked into it and kind of disconnect from your support group. But it's so just kind of remind yourself like it's okay to to have time off and it's okay to ask for help. A lot of times if you do take that time off and kind of reconnect with your support group, you'll be able to benefit your business from it one way or another. But even if not, like you still have to be a human being because two years in, I've definitely had some, uh, some moments that were not, not very good that I could have definitely avoided if my self care had been better. So I, I would really urge people to prioritize that. Like remember to eat, remember to drink water and like just be, make yourself more important than your business. Cause your business needs you to survive. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think being well-rounded and we talk about balance, but as entrepreneurs, there is, the business is a majority of our time. Our families get involved in it, our children, whatever. That's just the way it is just because we become part of the business. But I agree with you. There needs to be an understanding that the business benefits when the, when you take time to exercise or eat properly or actually drink water um, mm -hmm. which I agree with you, especially when I first started, I would like miss breakfast and then I miss lunch. And then next thing you know, I haven't drinking any liquid for like eight hours during that day. And, um, if my breath didn't smell a certain way, I wouldn't even, be, wouldn't even recognize I would keep going because I'm in battle mode or whatever. And like everything just, I become hyper-focused. And yeah, so, and I do think it's normal, but it's like, it's just, I don't know if, if someone like me that I feel like I'm pretty aware of self care can get that far off balance, then I like really worry about other entrepreneurs sometimes that I see around me. So just like, don't let it get that bad. Cause I feel like people take their, their health for granted a lot. And that's something I'm learning not to do. Cause it's like, if I, if I don't have that, like I can't do anything that I'm doing. And yes, I've hired people that are amazing, but like if, if I suddenly am, not healthy enough to run my business, then like everyone's going to lose their job. And this whole vision is for nothing. So like, why would you, it's, it's, it's funny how the things that are most important are the things that we forget. So I think it's a good reminder. I love this. And I'm going to break it down a little bit more for everyone because, and for you, and I'm going to ask you a question after this, because I think it's important. I would normally ask anyone I was mentoring or coaching this question, but the first part of it is, um, well, actually, I'm going to ask the question first. What do you think your superpowers are? What are the things that you think you do best in your business? Um, I think, like what I was saying about figuring things out, but a lot that's really tied into visualization. That's something I'm really good at. Um, if I'm really frustrated or I just like really desperately like need to remind myself of what I'm doing, I'll it's not hard. It's not hard to keep going towards a goal, like through the difficult days, if you can see it really clearly, but most importantly, if it's a goal that you actually really want and believe in. So I think I've gotten really good at figuring out what's worth my time and attention, especially because I know I'm going to be able to accomplish what I set my mind to. So it's like, if I set my mind to something that's not really what I want, then it's, it's going to be a waste of my time. So like, goal setting I think is is good something that I'm good at and you seem like a go-getter you seem to live by it's in the book by um oh my gosh Napoleon Hill and positive success through a positive mental attitude I think is the name of the book but basically you're talking about like PMA and you're talking about um uh visioning things and and staying positive and and goal oriented meaning if you do it now I think is in the book it's one of the things like if it comes to my mind I'm going to do it now why procrastinate and I think that you talk a little bit about that and I think that's pretty cool like just do it now like why wait what are you waiting for the secret 
to the mojo of being an entrepreneur is just to do it now. And don't worry about the fear and being scared. Just know that you there's possible failure and it's a growing experience and you get to grow from it. And I don't even call mm-hmm. them failures anymore. I try to call them uh, opportunities for growth. Um, but it depends. You know, some days are worse than others and it all depends. Um, I, and now I want to touch on something else you said. Um, the balance thing. And for me, I'm just going to give it for the audience. And I think it's different for everyone, but I break it down into mental, physical, and spiritual for me. Like I have mental balance and health and I have physical health and balance and I have spiritual health and balance. And in my career over the last 25 years or in my lifetime of being an entrepreneur, considering I started mowing lawns when I was four years old. So that's 38 years of the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and having my parents teach me business and everything else and paying for things and gasoline and depreciation at such a young age. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think at, I love that it helped me, but at other times I'm like, it's harder for me to make relationships with people because I my fundamentals are just so different. I'm always optimizing everything for profitability because I grew up on a farm and, and the risk even going to zero sometimes was worth the reward of going the other direction because on farms you have bad years and then you got to take giant risk and nothing's ever standard and that's just what happens um uh and you got to take risks to stay alive unfortunately and that being said as i went through my journey i discovered about 12 years into ours about 30 years old where I use spirituality to get there, but my mental game was suffering. Like mental things, like past habits, like family, negative family patterns, things like that were starting to impact me, were starting to impact my decisions because the more success and the more I built myself up mentally and stronger and mental toughness and reading and being an entrepreneur and going to school, the more those weaknesses or those flaws in my character exposed themselves and came to the surface weirdly, like I had to deal with them more often. So there was that. And then, you know, it took me maybe eight, nine years of, of going through that. And then, you know, I'm in my late 30s. And then I'm like, okay, the physical aspect attached with the mental aspect and 75 hard comes into the picture. And mm-hmm. that starts tying things in. And I've always been physical and I've always worked out and I've always been healthy being in the health food business. But I never tied it together properly properly with my mental my mental health. I never tied it together with a habit that I formed every day um, where – Normally, like working out, everyone's like, oh, rest days and stuff like that. Even as a soccer player, like you'd have Sundays off and a light jog. But in my new mindset, there are no days off. It's just how I weigh it because I can't afford a day off. I have to be making distance every day. And that's where the physical thing came in. And then lastly, weirdly, right now in my current zone, I am really working on my spirituality and my understanding, like, There are times where I felt I'm aligned with God and my plan's right on par with his and my will. There's other times it's not. But right now where I'm at is I'm trying to be a more humble person. And I'm trying to give more to the world as a servant leader and not be so rough. Because now that I have the mental and physical toughness thing down, you know, on top of my personality already to be a go-getter, I can come off hard and I can come off as too much for people, particularly individuals who aren't inspired to do more than they're doing and just want to get by with what, what they're doing. Like I'm hard for them and they're hard for me. So my spirituality is how do I then connect and inspire these people? How do I give more to the world? How do I give more back to the world on a grander level and things like this podcast where my legacy is not so much attached to what I did but who I influence and what they were able to do. And I'm going to leave this with everyone because it matters. And Ed Milad, who's a mentor of mine, and he's in he's one of the Arite Syndicate founders with Andy Frisella, who awesome. are mentors of mine. I just finished one of his books. Yeah, The Power of One More. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the reason the book's named that is because, and he'll admit this, and he talks about it in podcasts and his show all the time, is his father grew up in a program. And that program, when he was 14 years old, helped his father stay a good human for the rest of his life. But because he was influenced by his father going through that, he now influences hundreds of millions of people based on those same principles that were in that program that we talked about earlier. So 
I'm just saying that we don't know what we're do what we do and when we spiritually align ourselves or we allow God to do his work or we allow to just you know we're actors in the grand scheme of God's plan and we have to follow a script for the most part but we also have to use our own will to take what's been given to us and grow it like I I was born an entrepreneur but if I didn't grow it through my own will I I didn't do anything and I always people are like well what do you mean I'm like God created the tree I have to create the furniture out of it but am I creating the furniture out of it based on my own mind or is it because some other human put the image of furniture in my mind and they chopped down a tree way long time ago and built the furniture now I'm just creating it in the image that I know that's from another human from a legacy long, long time ago that I can improve on if I want to in my own way. Mm -hmm. That's the way it works, guys. That's the best I can put it. Like for me, for my understanding, I take what's been given to me and I turn it into something more useful that benefits humanity, that grows them. And now it's even so much higher than that. It's how do I regenerate the planet? How do I actually grow lives? How do I make sure that whatever I'm saying to people or my influence on them doesn't negatively impact their family or their legacies? How do I make sure that it's always coming from a place of growth and positivity and not selfishness? Like it's not about me. It's about the long run. And that's part of the spirituality and just dealing with it. So I'm just saying as an entrepreneur, there's always, everyone always says it. Of course, it's true. Like, I am a little bit more on the narcissistic table than someone else. I, I do have a little bit more control over things than and than other people. It, it does look that way. But it's really because I have more discipline in my life. Like, I do 75 hard every day. I have a regimen. I eat the way I've been eating for the last five years. You know, probably longer, actually. Probably 14 years. Um, and so it's just those things that stack up. It's not necessarily the this big, big bang theory, like things are just created and your life changes that way. I feel like it takes time and I've had to concentrate on mental uh, health first. And then, then I had to do physical health again. And even though I was pretty good at both, I was I realized that I have a lifetime to grow in both also. And then now the spirituality, which I feel ties all three together. But I think from an entrepreneurial standpoint and having such influence in the world and being leaders and guiders for the world around us, it's important that we have these in balance. And for me personally, um, I'm going to pass this down to Anna, is I wish I would have worked on these things earlier when I was just starting my business. And I put these core values better into my businesses and these ethics and these morals that do matter, not because I'm trying to be better or I think I'm better than everyone or looking down on everyone because I get that a lot. Like, well, you think you're better than me and looking down at me? No, 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 no. (laughs) These are tools in the business. You spend more time in your business than anywhere else. And if you can get tools that guide this business and make it successful, but also do the same in your personal life for your family, then everyone wins. And the business does too by you being happy at home. And your family growing keeps your family happy. A stagnant family does not stay happy. I'm sorry, it does not. I've witnessed it. I know it. It does not. I've lived it. Stagnant families that stop growing become unhappy. Bad things happen. And well, it's the same with good. employees. I mean, nobody wants to feel like they're not growing. Yeah. Or valued. If you value someone, mm-hmm. you'd want them to grow. You know, if you value something, you you spend time with it, growing it, being present with it, or at least a lot, seeing it, hearing it, allowing it to grow on its own. Because that's a lot of what life is. I don't help people necessarily. They're helping themselves. I'm just someone that ricochets or mirrors back to them what they're saying with new added information and it's up to them to do whatever it is with it and I think often when I say I want to help people and I go at them I think that we're I don't want people to misunderstand I do it in a way that's in a way that's helping people that want to be helped and when I first started the mental toughness stuff I was like I wanted to share it with the whole world everyone should know this well not everyone Mm -hmm. wants to know it (laughs) <laughs> and it and I and I hear this a lot from people that are in AA programs and stuff like that. They want to go share their knowledge with the world and how much it's impact me. Imagine how much it impacts someone who's not an alcoholic. But what it comes down to and why the alcoholic has the advantage, weirdly, which we wouldn't think so, is they've hit rock bottom. They have no choice, so they're forced to go through it. They have the inspiration, the will, the whatever, hopefully, and the addiction goes away so they can have this mental clarity that allows them to grow mentally, physically, spiritually. So 
I found this podcast to be one that those topics matter just from my initial conversation with Anna or text um, some of our warm up. I thought it was time to go through some of those questions and stuff I'd been avoiding a little bit. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate Anna, you letting me do that on your episode. Of course. I'm definitely going to have you back on, maybe even have your business partner back on with you as well eventually so we can tell both sides of the story there as well because I think that would be kind of fun. And Yeah, uh, he's got such a different perspective and such a different personality, which I think is what makes us such a strong team. Yeah, I'm still getting used to having a partner. It's amazing. (laughs) Well, let me exit this question that I was going to have exit, but what is it that you think his superpowers are? Oh gosh. Um, well, he's endlessly creative in comparison to me. I've I've gotten more creative being around him. Like the mind of a a chef. I mean, I guess that's a such a, a unique thing. But he is really good at looking at something the way it is and wanting to change it and make it better. Um, there have been a lot of times that I thought I made something that was amazing and. Uh, he's been able to push me past that point to make something that is even better. So he's great at that. Um, He's really, really amazing at just like, I mean, he's, he's born and raised in Nashville and he's like a nature boy. So the business would not be the same without him. I don't think I had the same appreciation for farming or uh, just even plant life or animals that I have now, if, if it weren't for him, uh, we, we compost at home. Now we grow plants. Um, I feel like my life and the business is a lot more well-rounded having him in it, having those perspectives. Cause I can be a little bit more of an ad- admin person, more of a city person. And he just kind of reminds me of what's important. Uh, sometimes I, I don't think he knows he's doing that, but, just the way he sees the world is really inspiring to me. And also I've noticed I'm better if he's around just cause I think he can outwork me and he can out, out create me, I guess. So if, if he's even in the room, I'm trying to do my best just cause I want to impress him. He's really good at training people too. I'm, I'm a little, he's, I, I guess I'm the patient one in the relationship, but in the business, I think he's a little more patient than I am. Wow. I love this episode. I'm I'm actually excited for when I release it and to re-listen to it and do the editing. Um, Anna, thank you for agreeing to come on the podcast and responding and being so such a great communicator. I would actually say it's one of your um, superpowers. You're really good at communication. You're very clear. Um, and I bring a lot of individuals onto this podcast. And let me tell you, and they're successful entrepreneurs, but they don't communicate as clearly and concisely and accurately as you do it is one of your superpowers and i wanted to give you that before we left because i was just i'm a little bit blown away by it and you may not see it because it comes so naturally but you are very gifted at concise and concrete and very informative information where you need very little words to get the message across or understanding or inspire um so i don't know how you you grow that necessarily but the concise and the attitude and the mental mindset, I think is just all there in your message. And I can feel the emotion and the passion, but also the composure and the discipline and the leadership. So it's all there. And I, and I hope that you, you turn up the volume a little bit on that because I think you're outstanding at it and, and building relationships for sure. Um, you've built one with me in a very short period of time that I will value, um, in your honesty and your authenticity and, um, and just willingness to share your story and who you are and be vulnerable. So thank you. That's amazing to hear. Those those are the ones I put down when I was thinking about the values of a leader. So it's really amazing to hear you pick those out. And we didn't even get into that um, either. Um, and I'd love to talk about that maybe in a part two because we didn't even get into the leadership stuff and stuff like that. And I will send you more questions for you. And hopefully we can get your business partner on as well and partner. Oh, um, yeah. I'm sure he would love to. Absolutely. So one last thing. Where can they find you online again? Um, Instagram is the most up-to-date always, but we we also have a website. The um, the Instagram is Aitantissimo, which is our business name, but it says it's like a little cheeky um, prefix there. So it's A Y 
T-A-N-T-I-S-I-M-O. And then our website is tantissimo.com, which I will be updating any minute now, surely. But if not, just go to the Instagram. <laughs> I, I like the name Tatissimo. Um, I, it took me a while to pronounce it, guys. Just so we're aware, I have. I'm. I, many people say I have a speech impediment because I mix up words and sayings and stuff like that, which is true. I think my mind goes so fast it just merges things together. Um, You're making new words. Making new words. I guess it happens all the time. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, Anna, for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Um, what a great episode. Uh, Ana Aguilar of Tatissimo. Um, I'm really impressed with your story and your journey, um, your history, uh, you living the American dream and being a first generation here. I think there's a lot of inspiration there too. That's something you should hold on to and be really proud of um, and your legacy as well as you build it. And uh, I appreciate that. Everyone in the audience, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys listening in and growing with us. I appreciate you guys sharing the episodes and supporting the entrepreneurs that are on the show. I also um, appreciate the feedback um, and the ideas and the comments that I'm getting on how to better the show. Um, And I also, even though it may be things that's hard to hear, I do respond and listen to the feedback and know there's truth in every criticism and comment, whether it's delivered in a proper way or not. So I understand some of the delivery methods and the, the, the hyperness and the not understanding and, and whatever, but I will tell you that a majority of the stuff you hear on this podcast is for the benefit of the entrepreneur. It does grow you and it does work. I don't think I've had many entrepreneurs on here that have given a wrong message ever. I think off the top of my head, I can think one episode where the message got a little blurry and off where I would like it to be. But other than that, um, the entrepreneurs that come on the show, the entrepreneurs that are in the food space that are dealing with tangible things, they have a different mindset because there are so many of us and it is such a tangible item and you have to build such hardcore relationships with the food and the vendors and the employees and the customers and the clients because it matters and any flaw in the system in food is noticed faster than anywhere else like if something's missing a screw you're never going to know if your fan's missing a screw but if your food's missing salt you're going to know it's missing salt as an example it's a cilantro dish it's missing cilantro you're going to notice and i know that's that's obvious but it that is the way food works it's very intense there's a lot of ingredients there's a lot of inputs there's a lot of managing of inventory like you can't even imagine the inventory restaurants manage let alone massive food facilities if they're doing really long line items or a hospital system like we used to do that has 20 different diets across 20 different scenarios and and then you have a hospital system in northern california that needs diverse ethnic foods based on the populations and their preferences and their willingness to eat the food based on their ethnic preference and so and what the food they're growing up growing up used to so i i would say the preference is based on history which is based on the comfort which is based on safety which is based on their home which they want in the hospitals just to tie that together it's not oh i'm not going to eat that there's a comfort there's a thing that happens and why they want to eat comfort foods uh, or why we want to i shouldn't say they why we want to eat comfort foods because it gives us comfort and reminds us of a home and that helps us heal and get better so Anyone who's out there, break bread, build relationships. I think that's the two things that we talked about in this 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 conversation that really matters. Break bread, build relationships. And then the other thing I really want to talk about is from on a standpoint, which is the point that I want to leave everyone with is never be afraid to start something and never be afraid to move forward. All the years she was afraid to bake and do things because of one comment really weighed on her and a lot of us have those things in our life where the we we allow things that happen to become the definition of us versus just information that helps us grow um or overcome to become who we need to be or supposed to be or or want to be or god's plan for us however you want to look at it but um all the above for me and I thank you guys. So I went on another commentary there, but I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you for listening in. I hope everyone's growing and we're out.